Chapter One, Part One of Commentary on the Gospel of John, Book Six by Cyril of Alexandria, translated by Reverend Philip Edward Pusey and Reverend Thomas Randall. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One: That not from sins of the soul prior to birth do bodily sufferings befall any nor yet does god bring the sins of their fathers upon any punishing those who have nothing sinned but brings righteous doom upon all st john nine two three and his disciples asked him saying rabbi who did sin this man or his parents that he should be born blind jesus answered neither did this man sin nor his parents but that the works of god should be made manifest in him being desirous and not without good reason that the mystery should be explained or rather being divinely guided the most wise disciples were urged to ask instruction on the subject and they are inquisitive with profit by this means furnishing an advantage not so much for themselves as for us for we are benefited greatly both by hearing the true explanation of these things from the omniscient and in addition also by being warned off from the abomination of effete doctrines these errors not only used to exist among the jews but are also advocated now by some who are insufferably conceited in their knowledge of inspired scripture and seem to pass for christians such persons of a truth delight too much in their own sophistries indulging their private fancies and not fearing to mingle greek error with the doctrines of the church for the jews when they were in misery greatly murmured as if merely suffering the penalty of their forefathers impiety or as if god were most unreasonably laying upon them the sins of their fathers and scoffed at it as a most unjust punishment they even said in a proverb the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge and these again being afflicted with a like and kindred ignorance to those just mentioned by us earnestly maintained that the souls of men existed and had their being before the creation of their bodies and that these souls having turned willingly to sin even before the existence of their bodies then souls and bodies became united when in the order of chastisement the souls received birth in the flesh but in one brief statement the follies of both these parties are exposed by christ who confidently affirms that neither had the blind man sinned nor his parents he refutes the doctrine of the jews by saying that the man had not been born blind on account of any sin either of himself or of his ancestors no not even of his father or mother and he also overthrows the silly nonsense of the others who say that souls sin before their existence in the body for some one will say to them and very reasonably how tell me does christ say that neither had the blind man sinned nor his parents and yet we could not grant that they were altogether free from sin for inasmuch as they were human it is i suppose in every way likely or rather it of necessity follows that they fell into errors pray then what time does christ mean to define is that concerning which his word shall appears to us true that neither did the man himself sin nor indeed his parents surely he speaks of that which is previous to birth when having no existence whatever they did not sin again concerning such matters how truly frivolous and beside the mark it is to think that souls sinned before the existence of their bodies and on that account were embodied and sent into this world we have argued at length at the beginning of the present gospel in interpreting and commenting on the words that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world 
and it would be superfluous for us to discuss the subject again but it is necessary to say whence it occurred to the jews to fall into this opinion and supposition also to show clearly that from inability to understand the divine word they mistook its proper meaning israel once dwelt in tents in the wilderness and god called his hierophant moses on mount sinai but when he extended his stay there with god to the number of forty days he seemed to be a loiterer to those who had influence with the people who both rose up against aaron then being alone and falling back in contempt upon the idolatries of egypt cried saying make us gods which shall go before us for as for this moses the man that brought us up out of the land of egypt we wot not what is become of him then what followed thereupon i think it necessary to speak of briefly they made a calf as it is written and at this god was justly provoked to anger then indeed he threatened to destroy the whole congregation at once moses fell down before him and sought for pardon with much entreaty the creator of the universe granted forgiveness and promised to punish the people no further than that he would not continue to go up with them to the land of promise but would send with them instead his special angel as it were in the position of leader at this moses was sorely grieved and as god was not willing to go up with the people he inferred with some likelihood indeed that the divine anger was not yet thoroughly appeased so he prayed again earnestly that god would accompany them knowing that the mere guidance of an angel would not suffice some of the israelites and perhaps also fearing the weakness of the people and therefore deprecating the holy angel's hatred of evil and he entreated the good one the lover of men the supreme king and lord over all to be willing rather to be present with those so prone to transgress for he knew that god would pardon them not once only but many times and that he would grant mercy to those who should offend and god also consented to this then moses sought a sign from him even that he might see him as a full assurance and testimony that he had forgiven them completely for said he if i have found grace in thy sight manifest thyself to me that i may evidently see thee that i may find grace in thy sight and that i may know that this great nation is thy people this also god granted as far as it was possible assuring in every way his own servant both that he had forgiven the people their sin and that he would go up with them to the land of promise then giving as it were a sort of finishing touch to the promises which seemed wanting he commands moses to hew out two other tables for him the former ones as we know having been broken in pieces so that he might write down the law yet again for the people even in this affording no small evidence of his kindness towards them and when moses was ready also for this the lord descended in a child as it is written and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the lord and the lord passed by before his face and proclaimed the lord god is pitiful and merciful long-suffering and abundant in mercy and true and keeping justice and showing mercy unto thousands taking away iniquities and unrighteousnesses and sins and he will not clear the guilty visiting the sins of fathers upon children and upon children's children unto the third and fourth generation but now attend carefully for i am about to take up again the question proposed at first 
god declares himself to show his kindness and his incomparable love of men in a manner suitable to deity for we maintain that these were the words of god not of any other speaker not as some think the words of the all-wise moses offering up laudatory prayers on behalf of the people for that it is the lord of all himself speaking these things of himself no other than the blessed moses himself will bear witness to us teaching in the book of numbers when the israelites had again taken offence from unseasonable cowardice because some who by moses at god's command had been sent to spy it out spake evil of the land of promise for when they returned from the land of the strangers and were come again to their own people they spat out bitter words concerning it affirming the land to be so wild and rugged that it was capable of eating up its inhabitants they excited so much hatred of it in the minds of their hearers that bursting into tears they now desired again to be in egypt with all its hardships for let us make said they captains and let us journey into egypt and when god threatened to destroy them moses again prayed and all but reminding him also of the promise he had given went on to cry and now let thy strength be exalted o lord according as thou hast spoken saying the lord is long-suffering and of great mercy and true forgiving transgressions and iniquities and sins and he will by no means clear the guilty visiting the sins of fathers upon children unto the third and fourth generation forgive this people their sin according to thy great mercy as thou hast been favourable to them from egypt even until now it appears therefore that he who is god over all attributes to himself love of men and the greatest forbearance towards evil it will be fitting in the next place to set forth the cause on account of which the jews being deceived could suppose our good god to be mindful of injury and exceeding wrathful for my part i do not think them able to lay hold of the divine oracles in any way or to cavil at them as if they have not expressed what is most excellent or have strayed far from the law of fairness on the other hand i think that they only indulge their own ignorance in this matter to suppose the sins of fathers to be really brought upon children and the divine anger to be stretched so far that it may even reach to the third and fourth generation exacting unjustly from innocent persons the penalties of others crimes would it not at all events be more becoming to them if they were wise to hold the opinion that the source of righteousness and of our moral laws would do nothing so shameful for even men inflict punishments according to the laws upon habitual transgressors but by no means visit them on their children unless perchance they are detected as partners and associates in the misdeeds and as to him who prescribed to us the laws of all justice how can he be detected in inflicting penalties such as among ourselves are greatly condemned then this also in addition is to be considered by the mouth of moses he published laws innumerable and in many cases those living in bad habits were ordered to be punished but nowhere is a command from him to be found that children should share the penalties incurred by their sinning fathers for penalty is for those who are detected in crime and it was ordained that it was fitting to punish those only who were obnoxious to the law to think as the jews do is therefore surely impious but it is certainly the part of a wise man to investigate the divine mind and by every means to observe what things are agreeable to nature the queen of all things rightly therefore let us hold that the god of the universe setting as it were before him his inherent clemency 
willing to be admired for his pure love of men and to this end proclaiming the lord is long-suffering and of great mercy and true forgiving transgressions and sins would not wish to be known as so mindful of evil that he extends his anger even to the fourth generation inclusive for how can he still be long-suffering and of great mercy or how does he forgive transgressions and sins who cannot endure to limit the infliction of penalty to the person of the sinner but extends it beyond the third generation and like a sort of thunderbolt assaults even the innocent surely then it is quite incredible and of almost utter folly to suppose that god attributes to himself together with love of men and gentleness anger so lasting and so unreasonable to these things another may be added by those who support the jewish opinion and do not allow that god knows a suitable time for every kind of action for if he promises long-suffering and is found to yield very easily in laying aside his anger why is he seen to have added visiting the sins of fathers upon children unto the third and fourth generation of course this was done for no other reason than a wish to frighten those who expect remission of sins from him as showing that the object of their hopes should never be realized since he who with reason is grieved with them is so mindful of evil and tenacious in anger but further tell me what the hierophant moses himself indicates to us would he not seem to do a thing most opposite to all reason if when israel had given offence and was about to suffer punishment he proceeded to pray for them and while asking for oblivion of the offence and an exhibition of god's love for men he should unseasonably say to god thou art of such a nature that thou requitest the sins of fathers upon children's children for this would be rather the way of one instigating to anger than of one calling for mercy and of one asking mindfulness of injury rather than long-suffering but in my opinion by these words he seemed to importune god and to recall to his memory almost the very words which he himself uttered when he publicly proclaimed his inherent goodness for in what way he is long-suffering and of great mercy and how he is by nature one who takes away sins and transgressions will be most excellently discerned in the very dealings wherein he seems to be somewhat bitter in the next place then i think it is fitting to set forth in what way we may rightly understand the words which were spoken by god the lord he says is long-suffering and of great mercy taking away transgressions and sins then we will read that which immediately follows as if with a note of interrogation and will he not surely clear the guilty so that thou mayest understand something of this sort will not says he the long-suffering and greatly merciful god who takes away transgressions and sins will he not surely clear the guilty of course it is not to be doubted certainly he will thoroughly purge him for how is he long-suffering and of great mercy and how does he at all take away sins unless he purges the guilty at these words he goes off to a demonstration of his inherent long-suffering and forbearance even that he will visit the sins of the fathers upon children unto the third and fourth generation not chastising the son for the father do not think this nay not even does he lay upon a descendant the faults of his ancestors like a burden but meaning something of this sort there was we will suppose a certain man a transgressor of laws having his mind full of all wickedness and who being taken in this manner of living deserved to be punished without any respite 
but yet god in forbearance dealt with him patiently not bringing upon him the wrath he had merited then to him was born a son a rival of his father in impious deeds and outdoing his parent in villainy god also showed long-suffering towards this man but from him is born a third and from the third a fourth in no way inferior to their progenitors in wickedness but practising equal impiety with them then god pours out wrath upon them already even from the beginning deserved by the whole race after he has tolerated as much as and even more than it behoved him a postponement of vengeance even unto the fourth generation how is it not truly a commendation of divine gentleness for that he is wont to chastise neither son for father nor father for son it is not hard to learn from those words which by the voice of the prophet ezekiel he clearly spake to the jews themselves when over this same thing they murmured and said the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge and says he the word of the lord came unto me saying son of man what mean ye by this proverb in israel saying the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge as i live saith the lord this proverb shall be said no more in israel for all souls are mine as the soul of the father so also the soul of the son they are mine the soul that sinneth it shall die the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father neither shall the father bear the iniquity of his son each in his own iniquity in which he hath sinned in that shall he die but i suppose no one is so foolish as to think that god did not at the beginning legislate in the most excellent way but somehow changed his plans and altered his ideas for the better and like one of ourselves was with difficulty and after subsequent deliberation able to improve his legislation to what was most fitting in such a case if we praise the earlier laws we shall clearly be blaming the later and if we express an opinion that the later laws are superior we shall condemn the earlier by our lower estimation of them god too will legislate in opposition to himself and will have fallen short as we may have done of a perfect standard by ordaining one thing at one time and a different thing at another time but i suppose every one will say that the divine nature cannot be in any way subject to such inconsistencies as this and could not even have ever fallen short of absolute perfection it is then as a demonstration of his incomparable munificence that he alleges the words quoted above namely requiting the sins of fathers upon children unto the third and fourth generation for that the merciful god is wont to punish sinners not immediately but rather to do it reluctantly and to put off punishments for long seasons thou wilt understand from his own words and i was full of mine anger and restrained it and did not make a full end of them and again in another place for the iniquity of the amorites is not yet full thou seest that he was indeed full of anger for some were perpetrating deeds deserving fullness of anger but as god he forbore patiently and delayed to make a full end of those who offended him but in order that we may exhibit to thee as in a picture the proof of what we have said and from actual events demonstrate the praise of god's love for men to be contained in this text i will bring forward something recorded in the sacred books and will endeavour from the divine scripture itself to show the sins of fathers visited on children even to the third and fourth generation not unjustly but justly and in a manner merited by the sufferers themselves the story shall be summarized because of the length of the narrative 
well then in the first book of kings we read that after other kings ahab reigned over israel and burning with a most unrighteous desire for another man's vineyard he slew the lord of it even naboth for although he did not himself command that deed yet he expressed no anger at the wickedness of his wife at this god was of course wroth and spake to ahab by elijah the prophet thus saith the lord forasmuch as thou hast killed and also taken possession therefore thus saith the lord in the place where the swine and the dogs licked the blood of naboth there shall the dogs lick thy blood and the harlots shall wash themselves in thy blood and again immediately thus saith the lord behold i bring evil upon thee and will kindle a fire behind thee and will utterly destroy from ahab every male and him that is shut up and left in israel and i will make thy house like the house of jeroboam the son of nebat and like the house of baasha the son of ahab for the provocations wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made israel to sin and of jezebel he spake saying the dog shall eat her within the outer wall of jezreel and him that dieth of ahab in the city the dog shall eat and him that dieth in the field shall the birds of the air eat when the lord of all unmistakably threatened to do all these things and to inflict them ahab rent his garment and entered into his house as it is written he was pricked to the heart and burst bitterly into tears and girded his loins with sackcloth in which state god pities him and begins to allay his anger and putting as it were a bridle to his sudden fury says to the prophet hast thou seen how ahab was pricked to the heart before me i will not bring these things in his days but in his son's days i will bring the evil will it not therefore be right to inquire upon whom these things were fulfilled well the son of ahab was ahaziah who scripture says did evil in the sight of the lord and walked in the way of his father ahab and in the way of jezebel his mother then the son of ahaziah was scripture says joram of whom again it is written that he walked in the sins of the house of jeroboam next to joram reigned a third ahaziah of whom again the language of the narrative says that he did evil in the sight of the lord as did the house of ahab but when the time had now come for punishing the house of ahab which had not ceased from impiety towards god even to the fourth generation there was anointed to be the next king over israel jehoshaphat son of nimshi who slew ahaziah and beside him jezebel he slew also seventy other sons of ahab carrying out as it were the divine wrath to the uttermost so that he obtained both honour and favour on account of it for what saith god to him because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes and hast done unto the house of ahab according to all that was in mine heart thy children of the fourth generation shall sit upon thy throne thou seest therefore that he reluctantly punished in the fourth generation the wicked descendants of wicked men whereas to him from whom he received honour he extends his mercy even to the fourth generation cease therefore o jew to accuse the righteousness of god as a form of encomium certainly we will accept that saying requiting the sins of fathers upon children unto the third and fourth generation End of chapter 1, part 1chapter one part two of commentary on the gospel of john book six by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey and rev thomas randall this librivox recording is in the public domain three 
but that the works of god should be made manifest in him that which lies before us is hard to explain and capable of causing much perplexity so that it would be perhaps not unlearned to pass it over in silence and because of its excessive difficulty to leave it but when the jewish doctrines have been refuted lest another thing akin to them like any root of bitterness springing up trouble you as paul says for perhaps some will hence suspect that the bodies of men are affected with sufferings in order that the works of god may be made manifest in them i for my part think it seasonable to subjoin a few words with reference to this that thereby we may both keep off any injuries arising from this source and leave no loophole for deceptive arguments that god does not bring the sins of parents upon children unless they are partakers of their wickedness and further that embodiment is not on account of sins previously committed by the soul we have shown for by speaking in opposition to these two errors christ in a wonderful manner overturned them since he unquestionably knows all things as god or rather since he himself is the overruler of our affairs and the ordainer of those things which befit and are deserved by every man for in that he says the blind man had not sinned nor was suffering blindness on that account he shows that it is foolish to suppose the soul of man to be guilty of sins previous to its birth in the body moreover when he openly says that neither had his parents sinned that their son should be born blind he refutes the silly suspicion of the jews therefore after he had taught his disciples as much as was necessary for them to know in order to refute the doctrines which we have above stated and imparted to them as much as it was fitting to exhibit to the understanding of man he is silent as to the rest and sets forth no further with clearness the reason why he was born blind who was guilty of no sin previous to birth attributing to the divine nature alone the knowledge of all such things and a management of affairs which is past finding out but again he very skilfully transfers the language of his answer to something else and says but that the works of god should be made manifest in him does then some one will say the lord declare to us these words here as a certain doctrine as if for this single reason ailments attack the bodies of men that the works of god should be made manifest in them it does not seem so at all to me but rather it is evidently absurd so to imagine or suppose he certainly is not dogmatizing at all as some might think when he says this for that it happens to some to be smitten on account of their sins we have often learnt from the holy scriptures paul indeed plainly writes to those who with feet as it were unwashed dare to approach the holy altar and with profane and unholy hand to touch the mystical eucharist for this cause many among you are weak and sickly and not a few sleep for if we judged ourselves we should not be judged but when we are judged we are chastened of the lord that we may not be condemned with the world accordingly upon the sickly and dead it is sometimes by divine wrath that the suffering has been brought but also our lord jesus christ himself after he had loosed the paralytic from a long disease and had miraculously made him whole says behold thou art made whole sin no more lest a worse thing befall thee surely he says this as though it might happen that unless the man took heed he would suffer something worse for his sin although he had once escaped and by the lord's favour been restored to health but perhaps some may say we will grant that these things are rightly said but as to those who suffer something terrible from the cradle in their earliest years or even from the very womb are afflicted with diseases it is not easy to understand what kind of explanation any one can satisfactorily give 
for we do not believe that the soul previously existed nor indeed can we think that it sinned before the body for how can that sin which has not yet been called to birth but if there has been no sin nor fault preceding the suffering what then shall we allege as the cause of the suffering truly by our minds we cannot comprehend those things which are far above us and i should advise the prudent and myself above all to abstain from wishing to thoroughly scrutinize them for we should recall to mind what we have been commanded and not curiously examine things which are too deep nor pry into those things which are too hard nor rashly attempt to discover those which are hidden in the divine and ineffable counsel alone but rather concerning such matters we should piously acknowledge that god alone knows some things peculiar to himself and excellent at the same time we should maintain and believe that since he is the fountain of all righteousness he will neither do nor determine anything whatever in human affairs or in those of the rest of creation which is unbecoming to himself or differs at all from the true rectitude of justice since therefore it becomes us to be affected in this way i say that the lord does not speak dogmatically when he says that the works of god should be made manifest in him but rather he says it to draw off the answer of the questioner in another direction and to lead us from things too deep for us to more suitable ones for that is a thing he was in some sort wont to do and that this assertion is true here again how when the holy disciples were earnestly inquiring about the end of the world and very curiously putting questions concerning his second coming and going far beyond the limits proper for man he very evidently draws them away from such interrogations it is not for you says he to know times or seasons which the father has set within his own authority but ye shall receive power when the holy ghost is come upon you and ye shall be my witness both in jerusalem and in all judea thou hearest that he does not permit us at all to seek into those things which no way are fit for us but rather directs us to come back to what is necessary so also in this place having spoken plainly what was meet for us to learn he reserves the rest in silence knowing that it behoved himself alone to understand this but lest by being altogether silent he should as it were invite them again to ask him about the same things in the manner of alleging a reason and as though courteously fashioning some such answer as the question seemed to deserve he says but that the works of god should be made manifest in him which is just as if he had said in different and simpler language the man was not born blind on account of his own sins or the sins of his parents but since it has happened that he was so affected it is possible that in him god may be glorified for when by the power from above he shall be found free from the affliction which lies upon him and troubles him who will not admire the physician who will not recognize the power of the healer shown forth in him i think this sense is latent in the words before us but let those who are clever think out the more perfect meaning and if any think fit to be contentious and to say that the man was born blind for the very end that christ might be glorified in him we will say to them in reply do you suppose o good people that this was the only man in judea who was blind from birth in the time of the coming of our saviour and that there was no other whatever surely even though unwilling they will confess i think that in all likelihood very many such were found in all the land how was it then that christ only exhibited his kindness and power to one of them or at all events to but a small number concerning these things however i deem it superfluous to hold an argument wherefore the other opinion being rejected as foolish we will hold it true 
that after christ had revealed to us as much about the questions asked as was meet for us to learn he passed on to another subject skilfully turning aside his own disciple from searching into such things for we must work the works of him that sent us while it is day the night cometh when no man can work lo here again in these words plainly and reasonably he rebukes in a similar manner the disciples as if they had done something they ought not and having left the high road well trodden and firm had ventured on another which seemed not at all fit for them for why do ye ask says he things touching which it is good to be silent or why leaving that which suits the time do ye hasten to learn things beyond the capacity of man it is not a time for such curiosity says he but for work and intense zeal for i deem it more becoming passing by such questions to execute zealously god's commands and since he has appointed us apostles to fulfil the works of the apostleship when the lord numbers himself with those who are sent and enrolls himself among those who ought to work in no way does he make himself really one of us or say that he himself is subject as we are by a certain servile necessity to the will of a commander but he uses a common habit of speech even to ourselves trite and familiar for especially when the bare substance of an argument is not calculated to impress our hearers we are wont to join ourselves to them and to reckon ourselves with them for which reason doubtless the most wise paul addressed the corinthians as if concerning himself and apollos and at last added now these things brethren i have in a figure transferred to myself and apollos that in us ye might learn not to be wise beyond the things which are written while therefore it is day says he let us work the works of him that sent us for the night will come when no man can work in these words he calls the time of bodily life day in the time we are in death he calls night for since the day was given for works but the night for rest and sleep therefore the time of life in which we ought to work what is good people call day and the time of sleeping in which nothing whatever can be done they call night for he that hath died is justified from sin according to the saying of paul being found unable to do anything and therefore unable to sin thus holy scripture really does recognize a theory of a metaphorical day and in no less degree a corresponding theory of night and if taken into consideration at the right moment each of these metaphorical interpretations exhibits the aspect of the questions under investigation in a manner free from error but concerning unsuitable subjects and when it ought not to be done to attempt violently to drag round to a spiritual interpretation that which ought to be taken historically is nothing else than unlearnedly to confuse what is profitable if understood simply and to spoil its usefulness through excess of ignorance five when i am in the world i am the light of the world shall we then think that christ is now not at all in the world or do we believe that he having ascended to heaven after his restoration to life from the dead no longer dwells among those in this present life and yet being very god he fills and tends not only the heavens and what is beyond the firmament but also the world which we inhabit and just as while he associated in the flesh with men he was not absent from heaven so if we think rightly we shall hold the opinion that even though he is out of the world as regards the flesh his divine and ineffable nature is yet no less present among those who dwell in the world yea it overrules the universe being absent from nothing that exists neither having abandoned anything but present everywhere in all things and filling all the visible universe and whatever may be conceived of as beyond it 
is fully contained by itself alone the next thing therefore is to understand what it is that the lord says in these words having cast aside as a stale thing the suspicion of the jews and shown that they were foolishly entangled in unsound doctrines having given counsel to his own disciples that it was more becoming for them to strive to love the things that please god and to leave off pursuing a search into what was altogether beyond them and having in a manner warned them that the time for work will slip away from those who do nothing unless they devote all their zeal to the wish to do well while they are in the flesh in the world he holds up himself as an example in the matter for behold he says i also work at my own proper work and since i have come to give light to those things that were in want of light it behoves me to cause light to dwell even in the eyes of the body if they are diseased with the terrible lack of light whensoever any of the sufferers come before me we will accordingly understand what was said as spoken with reference to the occasion and in a simple sense for that the only begotten is indeed a real light with the knowledge and power to illumine not only the things that are in this world but also every other supramundane creature is not to be doubted and if we accommodate the sense of the words to the matter in hand i do not think we shall be found guilty of setting forth anything unworthy of credit six seven when he had thus spoken he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and with the clay thereof anointed his eyes and said unto him go wash in the pool of siloam which is by interpretation sent he went away therefore and washed and came seeing excepting the cure wrought upon this blind man as a type of the calling of the gentiles we will again tell the meaning of the mystery summing it up in few words first then because it was merely in passing and after leaving the jewish temple that he saw the blind man and again from this circumstance also that without entreaty and no man soliciting him but rather of his own accord and from a spontaneous inclination the saviour came to a determination to heal the man hence we shall profitably look upon the miracle as symbolical it shows that as no entreaty has been made by the multitude of the gentiles for they were all in error god being indeed in his nature good of his own will has come forward to show mercy unto them for how at all or in what way could the vast number of greeks and of gentiles beseech god for mercy having their mind darkened by gross ignorance so as to be in no wise able to see the illuminator as therefore certainly the man who has been healed being blind does not know jesus and by an act of mercy and philanthropy receives an unhoped-for benefit so also has it happened to the gentiles through christ on the sabbath too was the work of healing accomplished the sabbath being capable thereby completely to exhibit to us a type of the last age of the present world in which the saviour has made light to shine on the gentiles for the sabbath is the end of the week and the only begotten took up his abode and was manifested to us all in the last time and in the concluding ages of the world but at the manner of the healing it is really fit that we should be astonished and say o lord how great are thy works in wisdom hast thou performed them all for some one perhaps will say why although able to set all things right easily by a word does he mix up clay from the spittle and anoint the eyes of the sufferer and seem to prescribe a sort of operation for he says go wash in the pool of siloam surely i deem that some deep meaning is buried beneath these words for the saviour accomplishes nothing without a purpose for by anointing with the clay he makes good that which is so to speak lacking or vitiated in the nature of the eye 
and thus shows that he is the one who formed us in the beginning the creator and fashioner of the universe and the power of the action possesses a sort of mystical significance for that which we said just now with reference to this and what we consider may be understood by it we will mention again it was not otherwise possible for the gentiles to thrust off the blindness which affected them and to behold the divine and holy light that is to receive the knowledge of the holy and consubstantial trinity except by being made partakers of his holy body and washing away their gloom producing sin and renouncing the authority of the devil namely in holy baptism and when the saviour stamped on the blind man the typical mark which was anticipative of the mystery he meanwhile fully exhibited the power of such participation by the anointing with his spittle and as an image of holy baptism he commands the man to run and wash in siloam a name whose interpretation the evangelist being very wise and divinely inspired felt it necessary to give for we conclude that the one sent is no other than god the only begotten visiting us and sent from above even from the father to destroy sin and the rapacity of the devil and recognizing him as floating invisibly on the waters of the sacred pool we by faith are washed not for the putting away of the filth of the flesh as it is written but as it were washing away a sort of defilement and uncleanness of the eyes of the understanding in order that for the future being purified we may be able in pureness to behold the divine beauty as therefore we believe the body of christ to be life-giving since it is the temple and abode of the word of the living god possessing all his energy so we declare it to be also a patron of light for it is the body of him who is by nature the true light and as when he raised from death the only son of the widow he was not satisfied with merely commanding and saying young man i say unto thee arise although accustomed to accomplish all things whatsoever he wished by a word but also touched the bier with his hand showing that even his body possesses a life-giving power so in this case he anoints with his spittle teaching that his body is also a patron of light even by so slight a touch for it is the body of the true light as we said above the blind man accordingly departs with what haste he can and washes and without delay performs all that was bidden him showing as it were in his own person the ready obedience of the gentiles concerning whom it is written he inclined his ear to the preparation of their hearts the wretched jews then were hard of heart but they of the gentiles were altogether docile in obedience and bear witness of it in experience the man having forthwith removed his blindness washing it away together with the clay now returns seeing for it was christ's pleasure that thus it should come to pass excellent therefore is faith which makes god-given grace to be strong in us and harmful is hesitation for the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways as it is written and shall receive nothing whatever from the lord eight nine the neighbours therefore and they which saw him aforetime that he was a beggar said is not this he that sat and begged another said no but he is like him he said i am he hard indeed to be believed are such surpassing wonders and that which exceeds man's experience from whatever source it comes finds the intellect to be intolerant of it and is scarcely treated with honour when convincingly forced upon people's minds for the attempt to investigate what is beyond the grasp of reason indicates a state of mind akin to insanity 
hence i think the unbelief of some who had previously known the blind man haunting the cross-roads and who were astonished afterwards when they beheld him unexpectedly able to discern objects with clear vision and they are divided from uncertainty regarding the event and some who consider more carefully the greatness of the deed say that it is not the same man but one remarkably like him whom they had known for indeed it really is not strange that this opinion should be expressed by some who by rejecting the truth were compelled through the greatness of the miracle to adopt an involuntary falsehood others again keep their minds free from obvious objections and in reverence and fear they recognize the wonder and say that it is the same man but he who was healed quickly settled the question by making his own statement most worthy of credit as concerning himself for no man can be ignorant of his own identity even though very ill in delirium thus in every way the marvellous deed discredited on account of the unusual degree of power it displayed testifies that the wonder-worker is to be reckoned among the great Ten they said therefore unto him how were thine eyes opened with difficulty they consent to believe that he was the same man whom they had known aforetime and abandoning their hesitation on this point they ask how he had got rid of his blindness and what was the manner of such an unhoped-for event for it seems usual for those who are astonished to make careful inquiries and to investigate the matter of what has been done and these persons resolved to do the same not without the guidance of god in our opinion but in order that even unwillingly they might learn the power of our saviour from the narration and clear announcement which the blind man made to them this thou mayest accept as a beautiful type of the converts from among the gentiles becoming teachers to the people of israel after escaping from their former blindness and receiving the illumination which comes from our saviour christ through the spirit and that what we have said is true the events themselves will loudly proclaim End of chapter one part two chapter one part three of commentary on the gospel of john book six by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey and rev thomas randall this librivox recording is in the public domain eleven he answered a man that is called jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me go to siloam and wash so i went away and washed and i received sight he appears still to be ignorant that the saviour is by nature god for otherwise he would not have spoken of him so unworthily he probably thought of him and esteemed him as a holy man forming this opinion perhaps from the somewhat indistinct rumour concerning him that went about all jerusalem and was repeated everywhere in the common talk moreover we may observe that those afflicted of body and struggling with abject poverty never feel overmuch zeal in occupying themselves about making acquaintance their unmitigated poverty exhausting as it were their mental faculties therefore he speaks of him merely as a man and describes the manner of the healing he must surely have been compelled by the magnitude of the miracle to attribute a glory beyond the nature of man to the wonder-worker but from giving credit to the belief that holy men were enabled by god to work miracles he was probably drawn to look upon jesus as one of them twelve and they said unto him where is he he saith i know not not from devout feelings do they inquire for jesus nor are they moved to inquire where and with whom he was uttering discourses so that they might go and seek some profit from his doings but being blinded in the eyes of their understanding even much worse than he had formerly been in those of his body they are inflamed with most unjust anger and rage like untamable beasts thinking that our saviour had broken a commandment of the law 
that one namely which forbids any work whatever to be done on the sabbath and they raved immoderately because he had dared actually to touch clay rubbing the dirt round with his finger and in addition to this had also directed the man to wash it off on the sabbath wherefore in anger and desperation they spit out the words where is he without making any excuse for speaking so rudely for in their pettiness they bestow abuse upon him who rightly deserved the highest honour though they must have admired him if they had been sincere and had known how to honour god's power with befitting praises but thrusting aside in their extravagant maliciousness that which i think they ought in fairness to have thought and done they devote themselves to untimely zeal and falsely supposing that they were performing a duty in supporting the law which had somehow been wronged they inquire for jesus as one who had worked on the sabbath and thus wronged the excellent commandment by healing the man certainly they may have supposed that god was so to speak cruel and not compassionate on the sabbath and was very angry when he saw a man healed who was made in his own image and likeness and on whose account the sabbath was instituted for the son of man is lord of the sabbath according to the saying of the saviour thirteen fourteen they bring to the pharisees him that aforetime was blind now it was the sabbath on the day when jesus made the clay and opened his eyes they bring the man to the rulers not that they might learn what had been done to him and admire it for it was not likely that men travailing with extreme envy against our saviour christ could ever be pleased by any such thing but that they might publicly convict jesus as they thought of a transgression of the law and accuse him of being a wrongdoer in having made clay on the sabbath for rejecting the idea of the miracle because of its incredibility they lay hold of the deed as a transgression and for a proof of what had been done they exhibit the man upon whom he had dared to perform the miracle at the same time they think to succeed in gaining a reputation for piety according to jewish customs and proceed to strain the legal commandment to the utmost for in deuteronomy he who by nature is very god enjoining the minds of the pious not to be drawn aside to another nor to think that there were any gods besides him but bidding them to serve him only in truth and to hate bitterly those who should dare to counsel them differently thus speaks if thy brother by thy father or mother or thy son or thy daughter or thy wife in thy bosom or friend who is equal to thine own soul entreat thee secretly saying let us go and serve other gods thou shalt not consent to him neither shalt thou hearken to him and thine eye shall not spare him and thou shalt feel no regret for him neither shalt thou at all protect him thou shalt surely report concerning him and so the jews looking only at the errors of others and foolishly treating everything by the regulation laid down concerning one thing brought before the magistrates those who were detected in any action contrary to the law thinking that thereby they were honouring the lawgiver for this reason i think they inquired for jesus saying where is he but being unable to find him anywhere they take as it were in the second place him upon whom the wonder had been wrought that he might seal with his own voice the testimony to the breach of the law which had been committed by the actions of the one who healed him on the sabbath when the blessed evangelist is making it manifest to us that they were immoderately vexed at the making of clay on the sabbath he fitly hints at the absurdity of the thing by adding now it was the sabbath on the day when jesus made the clay fifteen again therefore the pharisees also asked him how didst thou receive thy sight they busied themselves about the manner of the healing stirring up as it were the fire of malice which was in them to a greater heat and asked unnecessary questions not failing as it seems to me to recognize the miracle for is it not altogether absurd to suppose that they 
who had come bringing to them the man who aforetime was blind had not expressed at all the reason for which they had brought him but as if they were not sufficient to accuse christ the magistrates compel him to confess with his own mouth what had been done believing that by this means the malicious accusation would have greater force for observe that they do not ask simply and barely if he had been healed but they seek rather to hear how he received his sight this was what they were particularly anxious to hear he made clay and anointed mine eyes for it was in this that they foolishly conceived all the transgression of the law to lie and imagining that laws from above were violated they thought that they were righteously vexed and that punishment ought to be inflicted on him who vexed them and he said unto them he put clay upon mine eyes and i washed and do see they receive eagerly as if it were a sort of food for their envy his confession of the marvel and gladly seize upon the excuse for their rage against jesus for the man who had been blind relates everything on this occasion very simply and speaks very abruptly in brief expressions praising as it were his physician for he is somewhat astounded at the nature of the deed probably he may have thought in his mind that jesus had miraculously enabled him to see by anointing him with clay an unusual medicament and it seems to me that it was very significantly and with sharp meaning that he said he made clay and anointed mine eyes for it was as though one might suppose him to say i know that i am speaking to a malicious audience but nevertheless i will not on that account conceal the truth i will requite my benefactor with my thanks i will be above unseasonable silence i will honour by my confession the physician who did not trouble me by an elaborate process of healing or perform the operation by the knife and surgery or effect what was necessary by compound mixtures of drugs or adopt any ordinary method but rather exhibited his power by strange devices he made clay and anointed mine eyes and i washed and do see it is perhaps worthy of notice that the man very rightly added as the climax to his description of these events the words and do see for it is almost as though he had said i will prove to you that the power of the healer was not exerted in vain i will not deny the favour i received for i now possess what i formerly longed for i he says who was blind from birth and afflicted from the womb having been anointed with clay am healed and do see that is i do not merely show you my eye opened concealing the darkness in its depth but i really see i am henceforth able to look upon the things which formerly i could only hear about lo the bright light of the sun is shining around me lo the beauty of strange sights surrounds my eye a short time ago i scarcely knew what jerusalem was like now i see glittering in her the temple of god and i behold in its midst the truly venerable altar and if i stood outside the gate i could look around on the country of judea and should recognize one thing as a hill and another as a tree and when the time changes to evening my eye will no longer fail to notice the beauty of the wondrous objects on high the brilliant company of the stars and the golden light of the moon thereupon i shall be amazed at the skill of him who made them from the beauty of the creatures i as well as others shall acknowledge the great creator so that however little breath of imagination or elegance of argument he uttered his language is pregnant with all this power when he adds and do see after saying he made clay and anointed mine eyes 
for the preacher's style of argument which we employ does not exclude all that is graceful in imagination or reject it as useless he therefore who had received mercy from christ when questioned before the priest speaks as we have said declaring in a truly innocent manner and to the best of his ability the power of the one who had healed him sixteen some therefore of the pharisees said this man is not from god because he keepeth not the sabbath in their folly they say he is not from god who has the power to work the works of god and although they see the son crowned with an equal measure of glory with the almighty father they are not ashamed unreasonably to cast upon him the blame of impiety and disregarding the report of the miracle they attack the wonder-worker with their peculiar envy and carelessly accuse as an evil-doer him who knew no sin they foolishly believe the whole law to have been broken by his daring to move one finger on the sabbath although they would themselves loose their ox from the stall and lead it away to water moreover if a sheep fell into a pit as it is written with much eagerness would they lift it out so they strain out the gnat according to the saviour's word for this was their ordinary custom with much folly and very desperately they do not give credit to christ for the marvellous deed nor from the work of healing do they henceforth acknowledge him to be what he is but they cavil pettily about the sabbath and as if in their opinion all virtue was observed by merely remaining unemployed on the sabbath they totally deny his relationship to god saying that he was not from god although they ought rather to have understood that the one before them had authority over his own laws and that it was pleasing and acceptable to god to do good even on the sabbath and not to leave without hope one who needed mercy for whenever will any of you refuse to praise the doer of good deeds or what set time can exercise a tyranny against virtue yet while they admired the ancient hero joshua who captured jericho on the sabbath and commanded their forefathers to do such things as are customary for conquerors and himself by no means observed the proper sabbath rest they persistently attack christ and as their personal ill-feeling prompted them not only strive to take away from him the glory due to god but also to rob him of the honour due to holy men and being stirred up by their mere malice to speak very inconsiderately they pour forth a charge of impiety against him who justifies the world and for that very purpose came from the father to us but others said how can a man that is a sinner do such signs and there was a division among them even these still think too meanly speaking and reckoning as of a mere man only being convinced by the marvellous deed they give the palm to christ rather than to the law and putting the proof afforded by the divine sign in opposition to the sabbath rest on this occasion they appear in a better light as just judges yet was it not acting greatly in opposition to the precepts laid down respecting the sabbath to withdraw altogether the charge of transgression and to acquit him of sin who had not hesitated when he thought fit to do something even on the sabbath but coming to this conclusion by reasoning which seems unanswerable and has much common sense in it they argue thus for it is manifest and acknowledged beyond question that to those who neglect the divine law and set at naught precepts ratified from on high god would never give the power to achieve anything wonderful to christ however in the opinion of the jews he gave such power although he slighted the law respecting the sabbath certainly the doing something on the sabbath does not necessarily involve sin but neither can any one doubt that the doing of good works is far better than remaining unemployed on that day 
at all events as the saviour himself somewhere else says it is permitted to the levites to minister on the sabbath and they exercise their functions on that day without blame or rather their remaining unemployed would be blamable for would any one find fault if they were detected sacrificing oxen on the sabbath or even attending to other kinds of offerings he would on the other hand more probably accuse them if they were not doing their duty and fulfilling the regulations of divine service when therefore things dedicated according to the law for the good of certain persons are brought to the divine altar even on the sabbath without prohibition is it not more fitting still that a kind action should be performed unto a man for whose sake the marvellous deed might be acceptable even on the sabbath by just reasoning therefore some of the jews are inclined to an excellent judgment and putting off by an effort from the eyes of their understanding the mist of ignorance that characterizes their nation they admire the glory of the saviour although as yet not very ardently for they speak of him less worthily than they ought and they separate themselves from those who were actually condemning him for the one part unholily allowed themselves to be swayed by envy more than by just reasoning and treat as a transgression that which in its nature could not in any wise be blamed whereas the others rightly considering the nature of the action condemn such a foolish accusation it is of course possible that it was with reference to some other matter that they chose to say how can a man that is a sinner do such signs perhaps to put it briefly they are eager to defend the general practice of holy men for say they if we allow that it is quite possible for habitual transgressors to make themselves glorious by extraordinary actions and to be seen working marvellous deeds what is there any longer to hinder those fond of making accusations from bringing charges against most of the prophets or indeed by and by attacking the blessed moses himself and lightly esteeming one so venerable even though he was borne witness to by the most mighty actions of all these men therefore may be contending for the reputation of the fathers as at stake in christ treating the circumstances respecting him as a sort of pretext for showing their love towards them seventeen they say therefore unto the blind man again what sayest thou of him in that he opened thine eyes they imagine those who are disposed to judge fairly to be wandering in their wits and they seem to me to have forgotten altogether him who says judge righteous judgment and having been taken captive as it were in the bonds of envy they cannot endure to listen at all to any word that honours christ turning away from any one wishing to speak of his miracles as from some one most hostile to themselves and mistrusting their own powers of explanation they haughtily addressed their words to the man that had been healed again they ask what had been many times told them having already proclaimed their belief that he who had performed an action contrary to the sabbath was both worthless and wicked they think that in this way the blind man will join them in condemning him and take his cue from their words that he will suppress all outward signs of gratitude out of fear and trembling before their anger and readily charge jesus with contempt of the law because of its being the sabbath evil therefore was the design of the pharisees and it cannot be doubted that it was foolish also for how could the voice of one thankless man weaken the force of the miracle and would not christ's divine glory appear if it so happened that the blind man overcome by fear should deny the kindness he had received in order to avoid suffering anything from those wont to inflict pain but envy is powerful to persuade those who are bursting with it to eagerly do anything in their passion even though it involves conduct very fairly open to ridicule 
the mind which is free from such thoughts however is not entangled by foolish arguments but ever preserving its natural excellence untarnished is borne directly towards a right conclusion and does not go beyond the limits of truth mean therefore and insolent are the pharisees thinking that those who choose to think and speak rightly are wandering in their wits and endeavouring to compel the man to speak evil words concerning him who had miraculously bestowed on him an unhoped-for blessing but he was disposed to express gratitude and had been brought nigh to a clear knowledge by means of the miracle and he said he is a prophet they receive a sharp arrow into their hearts who do not admit fair and just reasoning and are eager to seek that only which gratifies their malice for as it is written the crafty man shall not meet with prey for their zealous design is upset contrary to their expectation and they are greatly disappointed of their hope when to their surprise they receive the reply he is a prophet for the man who had been healed judging very rightly agrees with the opinion of the other party for they not unwisely considering the nature of the action maintain that a man who was a sinner could not perform such a deed and he upon whom the marvel has been wrought all but pursuing the same track of argument declares jesus to be a prophet not yet having accurately learned who he is in truth but adopting a notion current among the jews for it was customary with them to call wonder-workers prophets deeming that their holiness was thereby borne witness to by god accordingly just as they wisely determined not to dishonour the majesty of the divine sign out of reverence for the sabbath but argue from it that he who wrought it was altogether guiltless of sin so also i suppose this man thrusting aside the petty cavil respecting the sabbath with worthier thoughts gives glory to him who had freely given him sight and having allotted him a place amongst holy men calls him a prophet he seems to me moreover not to have thought too highly of the regulations of the law for otherwise he would not have admired jesus so much or raised his physician to the rank of a prophet in spite of his apparent transgression of the sabbatical law having certainly derived benefit from the marvellous deed and having arrived at a better state of mind than that of the jews he is therefore obliged to admit a superiority to legal observances in the wonder-worker who in doing good works deemed an infringement of the law altogether blameless End of chapter 1, part 3chapter one part four of commentary in the gospel of john book six by cyril of alexandria translated by rev philip edward pusey and rev thomas randall this librivox recording is in the public domain eighteen nineteen the jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight and asked them saying is this your son who ye say was born blind how then doth he now see the envy against the healer which is hot within them does not allow them to believe what is acknowledged by all and swayed by the frenzy of madness they of course care little for the discovery of truth and speak falsely against christ first they applied pressure to the man himself and now they are seen to be no less rashly distressing his parents but with the very opposite result to that which they intended they propose a most superfluous question to the man's parents and they seem to me in their unbounded folly to dishonour the very law which they so venerated and so extravagantly upheld for the neighbours as it is written brought him that aforetime was blind and setting him face to face with those who were asking these questions they reported most clearly that he had been born blind 
and bore witness that now he had received sight thus whereas the law distinctly says that every matter is established by the mouth of two or three witnesses they set aside the testimony not merely of two or three but probably of many more and go for further evidence to the parents of him who was healed thus acting contrary to the law as well as to good manners but the law is nothing to them when they are eager to accomplish something agreeable to their private pleasures for when the testimony borne to the miracle by the voices both of the neighbours and of the man who was healed put them out of countenance sorely against their will they expected to be able to persuade those now being questioned to make light of truth and rather to speak as they wished them to speak for see in how overbearing a manner they put their question saying is this your son who ye say was born blind for they all but avow their certain intention to treat them very dreadfully and they frighten them with unbounded fear calling as it were by compulsion and violence for that which they wished to hear namely the answer he was not born blind for they had but one object and that an impious one namely to loosen the hold which christ had on the multitudes and to turn away the simple faith of such as were now overcome with admiration and just as men who strive to take some well-fortified city environ it on every side and besiege it in all manner of ways at one time they are eager to undermine the foundations at another they strike blows with battering rams against the towers so the shameless pharisees lay siege to the miracle with all their evil devices and leave no method of impiety untried but it was not possible to disparage as unworthy of credit what was well known to all or to distort that at which many had marvelled into a less certain conviction twenty twenty one his parents answered and said we know that this is our son and that he was born blind but how he now seeth we know not or who opened his eyes we know not ask him he is of age to speak for himself they acknowledge as true that which was in no wise doubtful for which it was hardly likely they would suffer anything disagreeable for they say that they recognize their own offspring and do not deny what really was the case at his birth but distinctly affirm that he was born with the affliction nevertheless they shrink from relating the miracle leaving the nature of the deed to speak for itself and maintaining that it would be much more suitable to put the question as to how he had been healed to their son himself fear of danger is certainly a powerful motive to turn men aside from what it befits them to do being greatly alarmed by the harshness of the pharisees they do not observe that which is somewhere well said strive for the truth unto death it is likely that they did suffer something of another sort for the poor man is always timid and losing through his poverty the power to offer bold resistance often takes refuge in an unwilling silence and a forced acquiescence as if already completely crushed in spirit by the vexation of poverty he seems insensible to being burdened with other misfortunes we suspect that the parents of the blind man suffered something of this sort even though their answer on the whole is composed with great plausibility for every one would agree that the recognition of the man as their son was a matter as to which it was far more reasonable to interrogate them than the man himself whereas the question as to the physician was one not so much for the parents to answer as for him who had experienced the benefit of the wonderful operation thus they distinctly acknowledge what they know inasmuch as they are fairly called upon for this but what he could tell more truly since he had the more accurate knowledge about that they call upon him to give information and it is not without divine guidance i think that they added to their speech the words he is of age 
for this too seems to indicate the impiety of the pharisees because if he that received sight was qualified by his time of life to form a sound opinion when he relates the miracle and how he was treated he will not speak with the mind of a boy but with an understanding now well matured and probably able to support by argument those speakers with whom he agrees this then will of necessity tend to show the utterly shameless incredulity of the pharisees for behold they will believe neither the neighbours nor the blind man himself although it is not with an immature intellect that he gives evidence nor on account of a boyish understanding does he easily glide into falsehood but he is of age a fact which prevents his being ignorant of the nature of affairs twenty two these things said his parents because they feared the jews for the jews had agreed already that if any man should confess him to be christ he should be put out of the synagogue well and fitly does our lord jesus christ utter this woe at the heads of the pharisees woe unto you lawyers for ye took away the key of knowledge ye entered not in yourselves and them that were entering in ye hindered for again let the devout person consider if the beauty of truth will not correspond to these words for christ could never be deceived for behold besides the unwillingness of any one of them to teach the doctrine of the presence of the christ among them they both terrify with cruel fear those who could perceive him by the brilliance of his actions and by imposing a severe compulsion in their savageness hinder any member of their company who seem disposed to do so from acknowledging his miracles for by putting out of the synagogue him who was right-minded and therefore disposed to believe the wretches do not blush of their own authority to alienate in a manner from god him who cleaves to god and to persuade him that the lord of all is a partaker of the madness against all which they themselves possess the admirable evangelist however defends such and says that the persons questioned were overcome by fear and therefore unwilling to say that the christ had healed their son so that by exposing the magnitude of the fury of the jews he might make it evident to those that come after for what could be more inhuman than the conduct of these men who deem right-minded persons worthy of punishment and bring under the necessity of being punished such as it all understand him who was proclaimed by the law and the prophets and we shall find from the sacred scriptures that the unholy design of the jews was not unknown to the holy prophets for he who searcheth the hearts and reins piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and quick to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart to whom all things are naked and laid open saith by isaiah woe to the rebellious children thus saith the lord ye took counsel but not of me ye made covenants but not by my spirit to add sin to sin for he who saith that jesus is lord most certainly will speak in the holy spirit according to the words of paul but any one who professes the contrary will not speak in the holy spirit how could it be possible but rather in beelzebub surely then the covenants of the jews were not made by the holy spirit for they added sins to sins they first of all draw down the doom of disobedience upon their own heads and then they communicate it to others by forbidding them to confess the christ surely the design is full of the grossest impiety albeit the psalmist laughs at those who to their disappointment engage in a fruitless undertaking saying thou o lord shalt confound them in thy wrath and the fire shall devour them their fruit shalt thou destroy from the earth and their seed from among the children of men for they intended evil against thee they imagined a device which they are not able to perform for they were quite unable to carry out a design which fought against god 
although often and in ten thousand ways they attempted to obscure the glory of christ therefore they were turned back that is were driven from the face and presence of the lord of all justly being addressed with the words walk in the light of your fire and in the flame which ye kindled twenty four so they called a second time the man that was blind and said unto him give glory to god we know that this man is a sinner being unable to stop the man from speaking well of christ they attempt to attain a similar end by another method and proceed to entice him in a sort of coaxing way to fulfil their private aim trying by many arguments to make him forget christ altogether and not even mention him as a physician they say most craftily that he ought to ascribe glory to god on account of the marvellous deed thus pretending piety nevertheless they bid him agree with and believe themselves even when they maintain the highest impiety possible by saying that he is a sinner who came to destroy sin they bring forward no proof whatever of this slanderous assertion but being boasters and thinking something great and extraordinary of themselves merely because they were leaders of the people they command implicit confidence to be put in their discernment of character and lay it down as a matter of duty for the words we know will be found pregnant with surpassing arrogance by those who closely examine what they imply but thou mayest in no small degree wonder at the foolish mind of the jews from this also that whereas they decree that glory should be ascribed to god on account of the miracle since he alone is the doer of such deeds they condemn one who works the works of god by his own might and not only do the miserable people act thus themselves but they compel others to agree with them yet when they aver that by their own unaided knowledge they are sure that christ is a sinner they are ignorant that they assert something most harmful to themselves for being wont to boast greatly of their learning in the law and exhibiting intolerable conceit about the sacred scriptures they will suffer a greater penalty because it being in their power to know the mystery of christ which by the law and the prophets in many ways is typified and proclaimed they with much heedlessness cling to their self-imposed ignorance or if they possess accurate knowledge are always most pertinaciously unwilling to do what they ought for they ought rather to instruct the mind of the common people to comprehend the mysteries of christ and to try to lead others to the knowledge of what it behoved them to know but they profuse in arguments and mighty in boast and crying out with far too high an opinion of themselves we know set aside the words of the law account the voice of moses as nothing and think the declarations of prophets to be as vain as those of the thoughtless mob for they quite fail to take notice of what the voice of the prophet foretells will happen at the time of our saviour christ coming for he says then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall hear then shall the lame man leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb shall be distinct for the paralytic was healed at the pool of bethesda and after passing through thirty and eight years in his infirmity as it is written by one word of the saviour he took up his bed and leaped away like a heart yet when they ought to have admired jesus for that they lamented the breach of the sabbath and holding that the law had been transgressed disparaged the excellence of the miracle at another time when an evil spirit had been cast out of him the dumb man spake but they fell into such terrible folly as not to gain even a little profit from it the blind man received sight the prophetic announcement was fulfilled the word of the spirit was brought to pass to the uttermost and what again at this they go mad they condemn the wonder-worker 
they attribute sin to him who is able to shine forth with divine brightness and who displays as actually now present that which had been expected long ages before twenty five he therefore answered whether he be a sinner i know not one thing i know that whereas i was blind now i see the benefit which the man formerly blind had received from christ appears to have been twofold his understanding was in some way enlightened at the same time as his bodily eyes and as he possesses the light of the physical sun in his fleshly eyes so the intellectual beam i mean the illumination by the spirit takes up its abode within him and he receives it into his heart for hear how he resists the abominable conduct of the magistrates out of his great love towards christ and how cleverly he reproaches them as being well nigh intoxicated and beside themselves but he frames his speech with proper respectfulness and giving them their due honour as the ruling order courteously says whether he be a sinner i know not we do not argue from this that the man was unaware that jesus was not a sinner but shall rather suppose that he so addressed those men with the following design for he may be imagined to speak thus though compelled against my will to acquiesce in what is wrong i will not endure to slander my benefactor i will not join myself to those who wish to dishonour him who deserves all honour i will not say that such a wonder-worker is a sinner i will not give an unjust vote against one who is mighty to work the works of god the miracle wrought in me does not permit me to consent to your words i was blind and i see it is not another man's account of his doings that i have believed i am not carried away by the reports of mere strangers it is not cures effected upon others that i am led to admire i myself he says am a proof of his power i stand here seeing having been formerly blind as a sort of monument exhibiting the excellence of his love for men and flashing forth the greatness of his divine power something like this i conceive to be the real significance of the words used by him who had received his sight for to say whether he be a sinner i know not and immediately to add one thing i know that whereas i was blind now i see is not in the style of a simple statement but shows a deeper meaning of very wise reasoning twenty six they said therefore unto him again what did he to thee how opened he thine eyes they again resort to questioning and inquire about the manner of the divine sign not doing this out of good feeling or a laudable curiosity but placing and reckoning the speaking well of christ by any living being is baser than any villainy and worse than any wickedness they stir up all these matters afresh thinking perhaps that the man would no more repeat the same words but would vary his account of the event and say something inconsistent with his former answers so that they may lay hold of the contradiction and denounce him as an impostor and a liar for supercilious in their excessive cleverness they imagined the force of the miracle to depend on the mere words of the man as though it were not evident from the fact of what had been done and moreover i think that they may have experienced something of this sort such as are not backward in hating others unjustly when they are making inquiries about anything done by them which does not seem to have been rightly done wish to hear it from the witnesses not once only but over and over again wetting as it were into keener action the anger which seems too feeble for conscience ever testing our motives makes us uncomfortable and ceases not to accuse us of injustice even though from passionate prejudice we may feel a certain pleasure in the unjust action the man who had been healed is accordingly provoked 
and urged against his will to go over the story again and to answer the same questions while they almost make signs to one another to observe closely whether something illegal might not have been done in the working of this divine sign on the sabbath for conscience checks the savage design that rages within them and so to speak puts a bridle on them though they are unwilling to admit its interference twenty seven he answered them i told you even now and ye did not hear wherefore would ye hear it again it seems superfluous now he says to tell the story over again to an incredulous audience and it is useless for you to inquire so often concerning these things when you do not gain anything whatever although you learn and have conclusive evidence but you bid me now again reiterate the same words for no good purpose as experience proclaims for hereby the man who had been healed thoroughly convicts the pharisees of unreasonableness of turning away their ears from the truth as it is written not being laudably angry at the law being broken but by these questions bidding him who wished to speak well of the wonder-worker to appear in the character of an accuser rather than accepting him as an admirer for this was in truth their aim since the transgression of the law was altogether a matter of indifference to them and passed over as quite unimportant on this account they set aside just judgment and were only bent on gratifying their prejudice forgetting god who says the priest's lips shall guard judgment and they shall seek the law at his mouth would ye also become his disciples he has now confessed distinctly and without any evasion that he has been made a disciple if not by argument yet in consequence of the marvellous deed and has become a believer accepting his miraculous sight in the place of instruction for when he said to them would ye also become his disciples he as it were revealed his own condition of mind that he was not only willing to become but actually had already become a disciple and in some degree even before he had fullness of faith acting upon the precept freely ye received freely give he was prepared at once and very unselfishly to communicate his advantages to them he affirms unhesitatingly and often his account of the marvellous deed if they had only considered his narrative really as instruction he certainly therefore observed in an excellent way that in the book of proverbs he speaketh in the ears of them that hear it seems probable that some deep and hidden meaning is obscurely intimated in these words of his and i will briefly state what it is there were some of the magistrates who recognized that the wonder-worker was in truth christ but keeping their knowledge of him buried so to speak within their hearts they as yet were unsuspected by the majority of their companions and our witness will be the wise evangelist himself where he says that the rulers knew that he was the christ but because of the pharisees they did not confess it the proofs of this will be strengthened also to some extent by nicodemus boldly proclaiming and saying to our lord jesus christ rabbi we know that thou art a teacher come from god and that no man can do these signs that thou doest except god be with him certainly therefore some of the rulers knew and the report of this was spread abroad throughout all jerusalem the majority of the jews suspected that the rulers knew but were determined not to confess it through malice and envy and that this also is true we will show from the evangelical writings themselves for the blessed john himself somewhere says that jesus stood teaching in the very temple and explaining things which at least to the understanding of the hearers seemed to be breaking the law and when the magistrates of the jews did not proceed at all against him nay did not venture so much as to say o fellow cease teaching what does not harmonize with our ancient laws 
they brought suspicion on themselves among the multitudes as we have just observed thus for instance it is written some of them of jerusalem said is not this he whom they seek to kill and lo he speaketh openly and they say nothing unto him can it be that the rulers know that this is the christ surely he all but says those whose lot it is to be leaders know that he is indeed the christ see although they are generally considered to be desirous of killing him he is speaking with very great boldness and they do not rebuke him even so much as by words accordingly this suspicion being spread abroad through all jerusalem the blind man had at some time heard it and had this report about these men ringing in his ears gracefully therefore reproving them as we may suppose he says surely it is to no purpose that ye bid me again utter the same words and again speak the praise of the marvellous deed or do ye indeed consider the narrative a pleasure thirsting even now for instruction from him although overcome by fear of others ye allow ungrateful cowardice to stand in the way of such excellent knowledge End of chapter 1, part 4